Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Julie. I'm an admissions counselor for the master's degree in counseling at Divine Mercy University. As you have questions during the webinar, please feel free to put them into the chat box function, and we'll be happy to help you with those at the end of our presentation. Hi, everybody. We're so glad that you're here, and uh, I'm really pleased to be here with you as well. Um, let me just bring this so we can all see it. And just a few things I'd like to share with you um, that I think will give you a little flavor for our program. So I'm ready. Is that looking good, Julie? Beautiful. Thank you. All right. We did it. All right. Well, thanks so much for being with us. I'm Dr. Kathy Irwin. I am an associate professor in the clinical mental health counseling department, and I'm also a licensed professional counselor, and I've been at this for quite a while. So I want to talk to you about something that is very common in our field, and that's a counselor's role in treating co-occurring disorders or when mental health and addictions combine, which by the way, they frequently do. Well, how do we know what a mental health disorder is? Well, here's how we do it. The book you see noted on the left is called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth edition, and a new one's coming because that happens periodically. And that helps us in guiding our decision about diagnosis. What's the importance of diagnosis? Well, I'll tell you what I tell my students. It's a little bit like archery. You can, you can shoot the bow all you want to, but if you don't aim at the target, you're never gonna hit it. So this is how we aim at and find the disorder that we need to treat and we understand what the consequences and the issues are. Well, what if there are two diagnoses? You know what? That happens plenty of times. And that's what we call co-occurring. Do many people have co-occurring disorders? Actually, they really do. Now, U.S. SAMHSA Department has statistics out for 2018, and they were working on 2020 statistics, but we all know what happened with that. So they're a bit behind. However, I'm sure this number will definitely be double digit by the time the next study is completed. The previous study showed 9.2 million adults who have these issues with drug use and other disorders. And pandemic isolation is certainly predicted to have magnified that number. And we find that trauma is often a factor. Cultural considerations are extremely important in diagnosis. I emphasize this to my students all the time. I'm teaching, I'm teaching treatment planning for, diet for trauma right now. And we've been talking about this in our class. It's important to consider whether your client is from an individualistic or collectivistic orientation culture. And by the way, you need to know that about yourself too. Typically, Americans are associated with being individualistic, as are some other countries. But of course, we know that in America, there are so many different cultures. We can't make that assumption about our clients, even if they live down the street. Collectivistic cultural orientation is different, and we have to understand both. And believe me, when you get in my social and cultural advocacy class, you're going to hear that over and over to you probably, as some students say, hear Dr. Irwin's voice saying, which one is it? because we're going to talk about that a lot. That's an important part of understanding your client's family history. We also want to know about spiritual strengths. Does the client have those? Or maybe no spiritual connection at all. Either way, it's important to us in treatment. And this image you're seeing came from Pope Francis. He showed this a number of years ago in a presentation, and I think it is so inspired as a way to look at our world. And Pope Francis said that this figure is a polyhedron, which expresses how unity is created while preserving the identities of people, persons, and cultures. I've never heard anyone say it any better than that. And that's really important to us in working with diagnosis. Well, there are pandemic-related diagnostic concerns. Some of them were already around. Others were emphasized. We all know the toilet paper rush. That probably be one of our historic markers about being in the pandemic is searching for toilet paper. But it wasn't just the toilet paper. It was the idea of scarcity and fear and concern and almost hoarding, if you will, something that we felt we were not going to be able to have. Another, of course, was substance abuse. 
people who were away from their normal routine, away from their work or their school, became depressed. Substance abuse was an easy turn to for them. Homelessness. We had a serious homeless problem already, but it has increased during the pandemic and post-pandemic. And not just among adults, but among families, young families, and older adults. Both of those are the largest group of homeless. And then there was excess spending. What else was there to do? Get on your computer. And it's so easy to spend excessively online. And many people did. And they're still dealing with those consequences. Suicidal ideation and indeed suicide itself increased during the time we were really apart from each other, separated from a lot of things that were familiar for us, a lot of depression. That also led to what we know is probably an epidemic level of domestic violence and abuse. We'll probably not even begin to know the depth of that for a while. And again, with online access, a lot of time on your hands, nothing to do. It was also easy for people to start playing around with online gambling. Well, sometimes you have to be careful what you play with because there are people who became addicted to that and who lost a tremendous amount of money and created problems that have gone on and will continue to go on until they're treated. Well, here's the thing. We know that we need more competent professional counselors to help in our field. And I go back to the example that Jesus, at one point, related in the story in Matthew. He saw the crowds, and he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless. Wow, does that not sound familiar? I've certainly seen plenty of clients who felt harassed and helpless. And from helplessness, it's a slippery slope to hopelessness. Those helplessness and hopelessness feelings are the basic components of, de- of clinical depression. And so Jesus saw the same thing. And then he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that we have a very similar problem. There is an enormous need for more faith-focused professional mental health counselors in all types of areas, whether it's working with children, teenagers, families, individuals, whether it's focusing on addiction counseling. My trauma class right now has been working on a case related to addiction counseling and the trauma that often goes along either preceding that or happens after the addiction process starts. You can be working with groups of people. There are so many different approaches to helping people. In fact, one of my favorite professors in my master's program, low these many years ago, said, you'll have a lot of titles. They'll be LPC, LPCC, LMHC, EIEIO, whatever they call you is fine. But here's the bottom line. Never forget that in God's eyes, you're a people helper. And that's what you're there to do, to help people. And in our case, to help people with a Christ-focused perspective. So this need for the faith-focused professional mental health counselors is really great. And I guess the question that we're going to be asking you tonight is, will you be answering his call to train for counseling? Believe me, it's a calling. It's not just a job. Because if you think it's a job, you're going to be disappointed. It's a difficult job, but it's a blessed job. I don't even know how to describe it, except some days are really, really hard. And other days, I feel like I'm watching the master work in a person's life, and I just have the privilege to be alongside, because clearly it's him, not me. And the next question I would have for you is, is Divine Mercy University where God is calling you? This is a wonderful program. I've been a counselor educator for almost 20 years. I've taught in several different programs. And I have to tell you, I chose Divine Mercy University. I wanted to be here because of the quality of this program, because of the Catholic Christian meta model of the human person is unlike anything I've seen in the counseling profession, secular or or faith-based. And because my colleagues, people who will be teaching you in this counseling department, are really at the top of their game. These are people that I admire, people that I enjoy working with, and frankly, 
There are people I'd want to go hear speak if I were at a professional conference with them. But indeed, I'm able to work with them. And we together have been called to train you if you choose to be with us. And for us, it is a privilege and an honor. And thank you for considering Divine Mercy University. And Julie, if you want at any time, if anyone has a question, I'd be happy to answer it. So uh, as Dr. Irwin was saying, um, do please carefully consider whether counseling is the right path for you. I call this our discernment slide. So um, just uh, please feel free to read through this and consider if this is, uh, if this is you. Uh, do you have the desire to help heal the whole person and help people flourish? Do you want a career that enables you to answer the question, how can I help people? What can you do to make a positive contribution in others' lives? Can you be an instrument of healing? And if you were to apply and be admitted, are you able to commit to the successful completion of the program? These are all serious questions that we ask you to consider as you ponder an application to our School of Counseling. Now, uh, a question I get quite often is, you know, I think I'm interested, but can I afford it? And we have a number of ways to make the degree affordable. Um, Right now, the cost per credit is 866, and it is a 66 credit master's degree. So 866 times 66 is 57,156. There is a $50 technology fee per class for a total of 1,100. And lab fees are 375 for your whole time in the program. And then we have a residency fee. Residency is a time where you come to campus for a long weekend um, to learn the counseling skills that don't lend themselves to online learning. So there is a fee for that training that's built into your tuition. It's $1,500 per residency. That fee covers your hotel, your meals, and your training while you're here. So that gives you a total tuition value for the whole program, start to finish, of $63,131. Now, this is the time to get in. I've just been told that tuition costs are increasing more than 3% in the fall. Uh, Now is the time to get started and save yourself a bit. Um, Graduate school is affordable. We have a number of ideas for ways to make it affordable, including uh, the federal loan program. So if you felt like you wanted or needed a student loan, we can certainly help with that. Uh, If you're working, some employers do offer tuition reimbursement. So it's worth investigating to see if that might be a benefit for you uh, through your employer. We're also approved for veterans funding. Um, we are we work with the GI Bill, and we are also a yellow ribbon school. Um, we do have a number of scholarships available. You see the link there. They're very easy to find on our website if you just search for them. Um, our scholarships are designed very nicely so that everybody qualifies for something. So the way scholarships work is you can apply for four, and you can accept two. Uh, Right now, we're giving away a bonus third scholarship, an extra $2,000 just for getting your paperwork started early. Easy, free money. You can snap it up just by starting your application. Um, Some people use private funds. We also have a matching scholarship available. So any nonprofit support you can find from outside our institution, whether it's through your church, through an agency, through a fraternal or religious type of organization, as long as it's nonprofit, we would match those dollars up to 2000 We also have a cash plan we can set up internally that's interest-free. So, if you, again, if you're working, you feel like you can chip away at it a little bit each month, we can you know, set that up in a payment plan for you that is interest-free, no charge. There's also an interesting federal program called National Health Service Corps. If you search this um, on our website, it will come up first link. Uh, This is, if you're willing to work in an area designated either low income or underserved for two years after you graduate, uh, you will receive a lump sum of up to $50,000 towards your tuition cost in exchange for that. Since you have to work under supervision anyway, it's a great way to go. Please feel free to search this online and check it out. I know a number of students have taken advantage of it. Um, At Divine Mercy, there are two paths you can take. You can either apply for scholarships and uh, take a tuition reduction in that way, or you can uh, apply for a tuition reduction through a partnership. Um, These listed here are just a few of our partnerships, um, and they receive a flat tuition reduction for just their affiliation uh, with these uh, organizations. Um, If you don't see your diocese or your parish listed here, that's okay. 
we'd be happy to create a new partnership agreement that would benefit you and all of the people who are affiliated with your institution. Our entrance requirements are simple. You have to have a bachelor's degree. That's step one. This is a graduate program. Uh, we do require a GPA of 3.0 overall or in your major or in your last 60 credits. Uh, if you fall a little short of this benchmark, that's not necessarily a deal breaker. Again, get in contact with me and I'll be happy to walk you through that. Uh, we also require the GRE. Uh, the GRE uh, is not used to make admissions decisions. It's a box you have to check. We don't care what you get on the test. We definitely don't care what you get in math. So that just has to be done. And uh, if you have questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them. And then of course, we do have an interview process. So if you, uh, once your application paperwork is complete and your scholarship work is done, we will set you up for interviews. There are two video conferencing interviews. The first one's easy. It's a quick 30 minutes with me uh, to prepare you for the big interview, which is a three hour online group interview with two or three other applicants to the program and two faculty members. Uh, our application process is quick, easy, and it's pretty streamlined. The first uh, part of the application, sections one through eight, is just a demographic form. Uh, once you begin that, our financial aid experts will be in touch to start talking with you about tuition, scholarships, and what you should reasonably expect from us given your particular situation. Um, once your essays, resume, tra official transcripts, your one recommendation, and your GRE have been submitted, um, we will set you up for your interview and then hopefully, God willing, admission. Um, once you're admitted, you'll receive a scholarship award. So you'll know exactly what that looks like. Classes begin on May 25th of this year, 2022. Thank you, Dr. Irwin, for presenting your material tonight. Um, and thank you all for your attendance in this webinar. Uh, this is my contact information. Please feel free to call or text me at that number. You can also email me anytime. And as a thank you for attending this webinar, we do have a waiver of the $55 application fee using the code listed there on the slide. Right, so Dr. Irwin, I think there were a couple of questions. Of course. The first, the first one in the chat is, if you've already completed a master's, what, if any, impact does that have on the application process? Well, I... It, well, one thing, uh, what master's is it? Now, I'll tell you my own story. When I decided to move over to the counseling profession, I already had an MBA and a PhD in management was running my own company. Um, it didn't really have any impact at all for me specifically, other than I had, a, a, I think I had a slight advantage in knowing what graduate education was going to be like. So I guess the question is, gonna, is uh, what is the master's degree that you are, that, to which you refer? Right, and um, the one impact that, from an admissions perspective, uh, that a master's degree has on the program is that we will, if you do have an advanced degree, waive the GRE requirement. So that goes away. So that's a nice perk for the work yes. that you have already done. Um, mm -hmm. If your uh, work, your graduate work is in counseling or a related field, sometimes, you know, psychology, sometimes some credits will transfer. So uh, that is also worth investigating. All right. So I think uh, that was all the questions. Dr. Irwin, thank you again so much for your yes. presence here tonight and for your wisdom and your insight. Really appreciate your time. Oh, and thank you all for being here and looking into Divine Mercy University. It is an exceptional program and our students who are graduating from this program, I know these are going to be the people that really help define our, our profession in the years to come. And I'm very excited for them all. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks for your attendance, everyone. Have a great evening.